It is a sad thing to talk about the losses that happen in our lives, and particularly this week. The loss of Dick Bogard, however, I would venture to say is not tragic, except in the sense that maybe death itself could be considered tragic. But Dick lived a long, full life. And as Pat has told you, he was a Cubs fan, and he got to see the Cubs win the World Series, as well as many other joys. And after 91 mostly good years, slipped away. It's a loss. There's sadness and there are tears. And yet, to me, it doesn't feel tragic. It's part of our life, part of the cycle. Chase White's death, on the other hand, is to most of us a full-blown tragedy. A vibrant, dynamic life cut off violently and way too soon, way too soon. Chase had made a decision to leave the U.S. Marshal's employment and return to the Air Force. And he had been accepted. He was a, at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, by the way, to go back into the Air Force. And uh, this week was his last week as a marshal. And so there's a kind of tragic feeling about that as well. He leaves behind four really adorable kids who Linda spoils like crazy and a loving spouse, Sue Ellen. Linda says the kids say they want their dad back. So this is grief. This is the universal human experience of grief that we have in these situations. And as we enter the holiday season, I just, um, I see the ads on TV for joy and, you know, getting what you wanted for Christmas. I saw an ad yesterday, I think it was, of, uh, it's, a, it's an ad that features a kid who wants a Mercedes car and then you see him a few years older and looks out the window to see if the Mercedes is there this year. And then it never is and you keep seeing him older and older. And then finally, he's like, I don't know, he's got a family and kids and he looks out the window and there's a Mercedes out there. So he got it, he got his life's desire. And maybe we could too. And I just find the, um, the reality of that frame of mind very dissonant with the realities that we're experiencing and in Linda's family and, and families all over our country and the world. It's not that there's anything wrong with wanting a Mercedes, it's, it's fine. But it, it doesn't speak to us deeply about what's happening in our lives. And after a while, you'd get bored with it anyway. <laughs> These two realities don't seem to fit together. Times were already difficult before we heard about these losses. Even before the loss of Chase, our world seems seriously off track. 
Even before we heard about that, King Herod's people were already in charge. In charge of a society fragmenting and losing its sense of meaning and purpose and and even decency. Just about a month ago, 24 of us went to Toronto, Canada to participate in a global interfaith event called the Parliament of the World's Religions. I, for one, wanted to know what the religious leaders of the world would have to say about the difficulties that our human family uh, are in. What insights would they have? What answers would they provide to the deepest questions? What would they inspire us to do? If indeed religions still have the power to inspire people to do anything. One thing that happened to me and to a number of us on the trip is that Canada is an example of a more healthy society than ours. And you can feel that when you're there. Or at least many people can. It's just more relaxed. And it's not as stressed out. And to the best of my experience, nobody complains about their health care system. It's a, it's a neat place. And then they had problems too. But not quite the level of stress. Part of what I experienced, at least, that seemed hopeful to me is that people from many different religious traditions and people from no religious tradition have many of the same concerns we have. Just go down the list. People from all over the world have many of the same concerns that we have, religious people and non-religious people. Things like violence, which just hit us hard, racism, rampant fear and hatred of those who look or act different from us, war, economic inequality, human rights, civil rights, a planetary trend right now towards dictatorial leaders, which is happening in our country, but is happening in a whole bunch of other countries too. It's not just happening in the United States. Environmental degradation and climate change. It sounds, and be, when hearing that everybody has these same concerns, I just say, boy, they're all becoming you use. <laughs> or maybe that's not it. <laughs> maybe that's not it. Maybe it is just a coming together of human concern about life on this planet. Concern that goes across a wide spectrum of humanity. We heard thoughtful and inspiring words on all of these topics, all of these topics, which are all important, every single one of them. We heard people give inspiring speeches And we heard people who had new insights about our human condition and what we could do about these difficult problems. None of them were left out. Although I must say that no simple solutions were revealed. No magic buttons to push. I must say, however, in all honesty, that of all these deeply important concerns, one in particular seemed to be expressed with a particular sense of urgency. And this urgency seems to me like an episode of Star Trek. And if you think back to all of the Star Trek episodes, in a I think majority of times 
there was a ticking clock. Do you remember that? We've got to get the whatevers to turn off the thingamajigger before the whatever dudes come over here and wipe us out. How much time have we got? We've got nine minutes. Oh my God, we've got nine minutes. Go down to the engine room and do something. And somebody do something else. Will it work? It's got to work. It's our only chance. A lot of those episodes. <laughs> the clock is ticking. And there's something we got to do. Or we're not going to make it. Welcome to Star Trek. Of course, in Star Trek, they always did it. Every single time. Were there any exceptions? I don't think so. Every single time they figured out how to connect the Wachamajigger to the central vacuum, physical, quantum, whatever. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. Oh, my God, what a good thing. And then it seemed like they would just hang around like nothing had happened, you know. Like, Boy, that was close. <laughs> Let's go down to the holodeck and have a few beers, you know. <laughs> of all the serious things that we have to deal with in our world, the one that seems very much like that ticking clock problem is climate change. The clock is ticking right now. And we are in that episode. We are the crew of the ship. And the clock is ticking. There, was, there were concern about all kinds of things at the parliament, but a lot of concern about climate change. And to me, at least, a few genuine insights. Insights that I needed because I realized I was in a state of relative ignorance and need to learn things. The parliament, to its great credit, brought in first-class speakers on climate change. Not necessarily religious speakers, but there were some of those. But, but secular leaders, including the president and research director of the Union of Concerned Scientists, who gave a tremendous presentation, which made me see things more clearly than I had before. Great charts and graphs. Really, here's the graph. The world is heating up, and that graph looks like this. All right? When it gets to certain levels, problems get really bad. And what we have to do is make it look like this. That, those are the graphs. So we also had a great presentation from a person whose entire work is about, well, it's, it's a guy with a PhD in communication, but his whole work is how to communicate about climate change. That's what he does. And we're going to offer a program about this on uh, December, it's the 27th, I believe. Yeah, it's Thursday. How do we talk about it? But here's what I heard them say, and I'm using my own, but they didn't talk about Star Trek, but I, I'm willing to defend that metaphor. Uh, we are in a Star Trek moment. We're in one of those episodes. That's where we are. We are in the episode. The clock is ticking, and the bomb, if I can use that, I don't know if that's the best mo metaphor, but it's going to go off. But it's not one isolated bomb. It's not like one big explosion of the whole planet. That's not the way it's going to work at all. It's an, it's an escalating series of emergencies. It's going to be a whole bunch of emergencies becoming more severe and more frequent. One of the uh, presenters said it will become more, they'll become more severe and more frequent until at a certain point this will be a place where really nobody wants to live. So what 
uh, you know, what are we going to do? We have to do, we are the crew. We have to go down to the whatever it is and fix the thingamajig or whatever it is that we need to do. There is literally no time to lose. So what is the time frame? Well, since this is a series of escalating future events, one can't say that one moment, you know, one date is the moment. But many people at the parliament and in other settings, and the reading I've done, really mark the year 2030 as a very important uh, point on the path. That's about, that's about 12 years. It's about 12 years. I find myself as I retire hoping I can live for those 12 years and be healthy enough to contribute. So that's a time frame. And what has to happen by that time is that we need to achieve really a significant shift in human behavior. Really, we have to change our ways in 12 years. And we can't wait till the 12th year to start. That's too late. And so if we don't do that, we face reality, the reality of it being really too late to, evo to avoid enormous environmental problems. We won't be able to reverse it if we wait too long. It's a, it's a math problem. Problems like loss of coastline and coastal properties, including major cities, much more violent weather like drought, hurricanes, forest fires, tornadoes, flooding, loss of food sources, severe starvation in many parts of the planet, mass extinctions, which are already going like crazy, loss of economic wealth in, by our country and all the other countries, uh, enough loss of economic wealth to create severe economic depression, uh, greatly worsened pollution. Already in China, in big cities, people often walk around with masks. So that's already at an intense stage in certain places. And then you've got to add to that all the social problems that one might expect would accompany these ecological problems. Because people aren't going to just sit there and have Christmas tea. Social problems will greatly increase, including uh, greatly increased inequality, uh, wars over resources, health crises, a uh, greatly degraded lifestyle for billions of people, probably almost everyone, decline of social order as the crises become more intense, and in all likelihood a sense of hopelessness and despair. It says in my text right here that I have an option of saying, have a nice day. I'm not sure if I should say that or not. So these problems are deadly serious and they're, they're on the way. Now, if the 97% of the scientists who say this are all wrong, then we got nothing to worry about. It might be that those 97%, they just lost their minds or something. Or they moved a decimal point somewhere up you know, and 10 years ago, they made a mistake and it's all wrong. So if those 90% are all screwed up, then you don't have to worry about it. They probably aren't. So the good news, oh, we need some good news. All right, it's the holidays. Where's the good news? The good news is that we can do this. There exists technology to shift that curve. It can, it can be done. There are things you can do that will shift that curve and bend it into not a totally problem-free range, but into a livable range. 
The bad news is that there is not a global consensus to undertake the transformation that will be required to avoid these negative scenarios. Our government, starting at the top of the org chart, does not even acknowledge that this is a real problem. I just want to tell you, folks, we have become the bad guys of the world on this. We are the bad guys. We always have, I, when I was little, I was sure we were the good guys. I watched movies, I knew who the good guys were, and it was us. And we have done wonderful things in our history too. But at the moment, we are holding this up. Yesterday, yesterday, at the G20 meeting in Buenos Aires, the United States was the only country that refused to affirm the Paris agreements. Everyone else agreed. And we said no. I want to tell you I am embarrassed, painfully embarrassed, by this total lack of judgment and really compassion and cooperation and intelligence. <laughs> I am embarrassed. And actually, it doesn't matter if I'm embarrassed, but it, what matters is we're holding things up. So that's how far we are from a global consensus. And in the judgment of most science, the Paris agreements are not enough. So to say we won't do the Paris, that's saying I won't do the first step, which is relatively easy because what is needed is more than the Paris Agreements. But it's a good starting place, and it builds consensus. But we are not in on, we're, we're not in. Even King Herod was not this bad. So, back to the good news. I want to repeat, there are solutions to these problems. At least I've been told that by people who look very smart to me. And I trust them. Because almost all of them agree. There are solutions to these. Like, for example, you could stop using coal. We're going to have to stop using coal. So that's one. But can you persuade the people of planet Earth to do that? That's the problem. The problem is not whether you can do it or not, but whether you can persuade people that it's important. The problem is that there is not a collective will to make this shift. So how do we create that will? And there, there was really talk about this, intelligent talk about how we can create that will. So one of the things that uh, we heard from a very uh, insightful guy, is to look at the message. How is climate change messaged? How is it presented to the public? When I think of the images that are used to create motivation about climate change, one image comes to my mind. And it's that polar bear on the ice floe. That attractive uh, polar bear that is going to lose their habitat. And by the way, is already losing their habitat. It's just, it's a, it's a progression. One of the things that this insightful person said is that that polar bear will not convince people. That is not a convincing argument. It may be something that you respond to. And we see that image, and we say, oh, that's a shame. But that doesn't convince the economic leaders of the world to change our energy patterns. That's not, a, not enough. So that polar bear is not going to do it. <clears throat> What would change people's minds and make people 
behave differently? How can, how can we present this? Because one of the things that was said at the parliament, uh, I, one person said straight out that the religions have to get on board on this. Because religions do have some influence over people. It's probably a declining influence overall, but religions do have some influence. And what we were challenged to do is to go back and say, religions have to get on board. Because there's some influence there. And that, by the way, the image of being an environmentalist in our culture, for somebody to be an environmentalist, is not a positive image. It's a negative image, actually, because it means you're a little bit wacko. You want to tear down people's factories and cause them to lose jobs and mess up everybody's life so that some little bird has their nest. What kind of a trade-off is that? So in the public mind, and being an environmentalist is not a positive thing. It's a negative thing. So ponder that one. Because we, a lot of us, think we are environmentalists, and that, that's great, but it may not solve the problem either. Tree huggers and all that kind of stuff. So, what is convincing? That was the question that was being talked about. And the person that I heard present on this and who really impressed me They've done research, they've talked to people about what moves, what would move us to action on this. And this particular presenter said that the thing that is most convincing to us is to think about the lives of our children and our grandchildren. To think about the world, what is the world they are going to live in? as our kids you know, grow up and become 40 and 50 and 60 and 70, what is their world going to look like? And he argued that that is the most uh, heart moving, because that polar bear is not enough, but our own children, our own grandchildren, if we can think about and talk about the world that we are going to give them, then that has a chance of being a message that gets through. If we don't make changes now, our kids and grandkids will inherit a planet that will not be hospitable to human life at some point. It will be un just too unpleasant. Doesn't mean that humans will be wiped out, or it'd just be a really rotten, difficult place to live. Quality of life will become worse and worse until you would not want your kids and your grandkids and your nephews and nieces and their kids and your dear friends' families to live there. So, what can we do? All right. I want to tell you that I am totally unqualified to talk about this. But you know what? I can't let that stop me. I can't go get another degree. There's no time for that. We gotta get down to the engine room and plug that hole, Scotty. There's no time to go back to school. I can say, boy, I wanna go get a master's degree in, in retirement. I could go get a master's degree and then in four years, there's no time for that. So there are things we can do. And by the way, if you would get, want to get a master's degree, go for it. We can do lots of things. We can recycle, we can reuse, we can turn off the lights and use less water. That won't do it. It's good to do those things. That isn't going to solve the problem. That's just not enough. It's not enough to bend that curve. We can do solar and wind, as we have solar on our church, and that is a great thing to do, to start replacing little by little uh, energy sources with renewable energy. That's a good thing to do. It's not enough. 
It's good. And the faster it goes, the better things will go, but it won't. It's not enough to bend the curve by itself. If we can put a solar up on every house in Peoria, then let's go do that. There are projects around here thinking about how to do that. Let's do that. And people will do it all over, but there will still be more that has to be done to, burn, to, build, uh, to bend that curve. We will need more revolutionary changes, and we will need it to happen much faster than it's happening now. Like we could say, well, we're going to have a project. We're going to get 10 more churches to have solar in the next two years. Let's do it. But we should not think that that by itself is enough. We should not think that. If we want to make a change in our personal life, we can go solar. We can get the... Uh, Diane and I were just interviewing someone in, in our new house about getting solar. We're all panicked because it's going to cost money, but we have to figure out a way to do that. We can go hybrid or electric in our cars. That's all good stuff. But there will still need to be more. One of the, study, one of the studies that was lifted up and has been lifted up in numerous uh, studies argues, and you know, every, your life is your personal choices, but what, there are studies that argue that one of the best things human beings, individuals can do is stop eating meat. Or at least beef. I'm not going to beat it, I'm, I'm not um, perfectly virtuous, but that has a powerful effect on deforestation, because most deforestation comes from uh, agricultural animals, and uh, methane gas. So that's an option you can think about. That has a help. That does something. Based on what I have heard, I would offer part of what I think is an action plan, because Part of this is going to be a political struggle. So here's what I think would be a good line to follow in making choices about our politicians, many of some of whom are in their room and we dearly love. <laughs> and maybe more politics, maybe some of you are going to run for Congress next year. I think that's going to happen. I could predict a couple, but I won't. Here's what I would say. Uh, I think we need to elect politicians who are serious about climate change. That's not too uh, revolutionary. And I think we need to say, not in a hurtful way, but in a direct way, to anyone who is running for office in this country, state or national office, that if they are climate deniers or they're not on board with trying to help the human race on this, they need to find another job. They just need to find another job. It doesn't mean they're bad people or horrible or anything like that. It just means that we haven't got time for that. The time doesn't exist. So, you think about that. And the best way to do this is lovingly. It's not, it's not personal. We've got to save the ship. It's a cosmic necessity. Now, what does this have to do with Christmas? This is a Christmas sermon, actually. You know that. <laughs> this is a Christmas, Hanukkah, solstice sermon. I'm going to pull it out at the end here. All of these stories, all of these stories are about crisis. Crisis in the human story. 
In the Christmas story, we have the crisis of uh, an evil king who is running everything. And we have a poor family about to have a baby at the darkest time of the year. That's what it says. It's the darkest time of the year. And this baby symbolically represents hope for humanity. Now, I'm not talking about theology. I'm not, this is not theology. This is just what the story says symbolically. It says that things are rough, the king is mean, it's a dark night of the year, but hope is on the way. There's a new hope. That's what it says. Hanukkah says that the religious sacred place has been destroyed by marauders. And we need to restore the sense of the sacredness of life that resides in the story in the temple. And there's not enough oil to do the ritual to re-sanctify uh, it. But by a miracle, there's more oil than they thought there was. There's more hope than we thought we should have, even though it looks bleak. The solstice story is the natural counterpart of these other stories. It's the darkest time of the year. The sun is disappearing. Who knows if it will ever come back? I'm sure the, our early ancestors thought, who knows if maybe this is the end of all of us. We're going to freeze to death. Life will be over. And yet this, the energy is there and it comes back and it lights up our lives and creates new hope. So that's, that solstice motif is underneath all of these winter stories. And throw in Star Trek. It's the same motif. We're, we're in big trouble. But if we work together and if everybody just does the absolute best they can, we can pull it out. We can do it. That's what all of these stories are saying to us, is that there is hope. That is what all the ancient myths say, that hope is on the way even in the darkest hour. But we have to provide a place for that hope. We have to join in. It may be that the arc of Moral justice, uh, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, but we have to push as hard as we can. We have to do that. It's really our only chance. That's the good news. I wish that the holidays for us can be a time of reawakening and rededication and recommitment to a life of love and service. And I hope we can hear in the old myths the hope that's there and vow that we will do all that we can in our time to usher in an age of cooperation and peace. And that old phrase, peace on earth, we have to rediscover what that means because we're going to have to live out a new meaning of what peace on earth means. It's not just peace between, between ourselves, but it's also peace with earth. That's what we need to do. Let us all have the wisdom and courage to answer this call which is ringing right now, and it's ringing for us. So may it be.